Welcome to Warriors for Christ podcast. It's a uh, beautiful Sunday morning here in New York, and I'm here with Braden again. Uh, we were going to meet with Kyle. Something came up, so he's unavailable. I know I said we were going to be doing that uh, the following day, but um, it'll just be Braden and I today here at my home. And we are here, and the title of today's episode is going to be Make Certain That You Know the Truth. And I'm going to share a discussion that I had with um, two young men who are uh, members of the uh, Church of Latter-day Saints and, you know, commonly referred to as Mormons. And the conversation I have with them really is pertinent to everybody. Uh, To many of the people, if you say that you believe in the Bible, well, there's many different faiths that say they believe in the Bible, uh, but God's going to say, I don't know you. Why? Well, today I plan on sharing the conversation that I had with those two young men. And I'll start by this. This isn't about me trying to make people just randomly believe in something. It's pointing you to God, to Scripture, to His Word. We must believe what God says, says is the truth. We must make certain that we know the truth. I don't question your desire to know God. These two men that I met with, uh, I could see they had a a deep desire to know God. Uh, They were committing their time and their resources because they wanted to tell other people about God and and the zeal that they had for their God. This has nothing to do with their desire or their zeal or their passion. What it comes down to is do they fully have the truth? So with that, let us open in prayer, and we'll get started. Father, I thank you for another opportunity. Father, I thank you for all people, all men and women, children who are willing to come and to listen, to examine your word, to challenge and to make sure that all that they have been taught is the truth. And if not, Father, that you... O oh God, would convict them. You would teach them and show them in your word what is correct and what isn't of you. Father, I thank you for the time. Bless those who hear. Let them be edified, O oh God, by your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so to start with these, uh, when I met these two, two young men, and this was a, a recent trip that God had me go down to Georgia. I had uh, basically seven days notice. He told me that I'd be going down, uh, traveling Wednesday to Friday. Told me how I would get there. Told me what hotel I would stay at. People that I would meet at the hotel that I would speak to. Let me know there would be other people there in the vicinity of the hotel, which was down in a waterfront area in um, Kings Bay, Georgia, in the town of St. Mary's. And everything, as God said, happened. And the reason why God sent me there was because God wants everybody to find the truth. He wants people to be freed and be able to overcome sin. He wants to clothe them with power. He wants to give them His spiritual gift for the equipping of the saints to do His work of service and to grow the body by adding souls. And so I went. I was obedient. This was the second time I went there. God had me go down earlier Labor Day weekend to anoint a pastor, starting a church there. And God is moving mightily in His family and those around It is God who does the impossible work. It is God who changes the heart and frees a man. It is not us, it is Him in faith when we believe it. And it is God who equips His church with His supernatural gifts of the Spirit to minister to the saints and to grow His church. Father, I thank You for that work that You do. Continue, O Father. 
and I know you will. So while I was down there this last time, I met with two young men as well. And as I mentioned earlier, they were from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormons. And they were excited. They wanted to share what they believed. Um, they wanted me to, uh, uh, you know, take their Book of Mormon and, and read through it. Now, I've already read through uh, many other different books. I've, I've read through uh, many parts of the Quran. I've, I've read through the, the, the different parts of the Book of Mormon. And, and one of the things I do that I go through and look for is, is differences. What are the differences? And even if you, we have the same Bible that when I explained to these two young men, they wanted me to read the Book of Mormon, I said, well, just if I read the Book of Mormon, how does that make sure that I find whatever faith you, you're expecting me to find? I said, I believe in the Bible, the Word of God. You guys also believe in the Bible. I said, there's many other people in churches and denominations that believe in the Bible. I said, but I'll tell you right now, I don't have fellowship with many of those other churches, even though we claim to believe in the same Bible, even though we claim to believe in the gospel, even though we claim to believe in God Almighty and the Son, Jesus Christ, who came to earth as a sacrifice for sins. And we both claim to believe in the Holy Spirit. There's much that we can look at in the Bible and all claim, oh yes, I believe, I believe, I believe. But the reality is the devil does his work in the church. He takes the word of God, twists it to deceive it. So that you hold to a form of godliness, but yet have no power. As he says, will happen in the later times in, in 2 Timothy. So how do we know? Well, the question is, what are the differences? Have we identified those areas where the devil is trying to create division? And do we understand, and have we gone to God's word to make sure we understand those differences? So with those two young men, I said, if you think I have erred in my faith, then what you need to point me to is what are the differences? If the devil has deceived me in an understanding of the word of God, then you need to point out where am I deceived? And then show and instruct me in the word of God. I said, otherwise, what's to say I don't read your book and have the same folly that I have with the Bible? And I just continue to perpetuate a false belief. So with that, we started going through a couple topics and seeking to understand. I asked them. I said, well, let's start with sin. What does God say is a sin? And do you believe that sin separates us from God? Now, they believe, as I'm sure many of you who are listening will agree, yes, sin separates us from God. But yet, there's also a belief that people think that, well, Jesus died for the penalty of my sin, but not to completely free me from my sin, that I'm always going to continue to struggle with sin and be a sinner. Now see, there's a difference. Also, understanding what sin is. If I were to ask everyone here, and I ask these two young men, I said, if you have a neighbor, and he goes and he murders the people around him, every week he commits murder, would you agree that he probably doesn't have the love of God in his heart? That he probably is not a Christian, even if he says so? Now, many of you who are listening are probably like, yeah, Sam, I, I think I would agree with that. Well, when you go and you look at 1 John, right, let's go to Scripture and just confirm some of these things. And there's an easy passage in 1 John that gets right to the point. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 through verse 15, Braden, what does that say? For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life, because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. 
Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Well, there you go. You see, if you have hate for your brother, well, God says you do not have eternal life abiding in you. It doesn't matter what you think or what you say. You see, what, what you realize is sin all starts in the heart, in the thought. If you have the thought, you're already guilty. Now, some of you are like, oh, well, yes, I struggle with sins, but, but you know, I'm not murdering people. Well, in, in whose eyes? Do you not understand how much God hates sin? Do you not understand that sin is in the heart? So one of the things that I identified in, in, with these two young men is they didn't fully understand how God looks at what sin is. Let's go look at some examples of what Jesus did. I know I've taught on this in the past and in different episodes, but I want to highlight it today again. In Matthew, we'll start with Matthew first. I want to look at two, pla two passages in Matthew. I think one of them is in Matthew chapter 12, and one's in chapter 15. We'll just go there and I'll find it. So in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus, speaking to the, the, um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the people, in verse 33 to 37. Braden, will you read verse 33 to 37, Matthew chapter 12? Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Yep. Go and read all the way to 37. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the judgment day. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So he's saying you've got to make the tree either good or bad. The tree is going to be known by its fruit. You see, the mouth speaks that which comes out of the heart. It is the heart. It is the heart of man that God looks at. He will judge the thoughts and intentions of our heart. The thoughts of your heart will come out in your words. It's more than just the words. It's the thoughts. But let's just look at the thought, the words for a second. Since we're on words, let's go to James. Chapter 1. I believe it's verse uh, 26. I want to point out a couple things there. You know, we just talked about hating your brother. And Jesus is going to have more to say about that. But in James, it's taking me a little bit longer to flip there. James chapter 1, verse 26 to verse 27. Braden, please read that. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So the question is, do we have undefiled religion? You see, a defiled religion, a religion that is worthless, it's somebody who cannot bridle their tongue. God says a deception is in the heart. You see, it gets back to that heart. What are the thoughts and intentions in your heart? You can't bridle your tongue? Don't deceive yourself, please. Do not. Do you believe that God can change you? I'm not talking about somebody who can bridle their, th their tongue through trying. You see, I used to always have to try to bridle my tongue, and I did a pretty good job at it outwardly. But my thoughts were unbridled. What we're going to find out is it gets all the way back to your thoughts. The question is, can you keep yourself unstained by the world? It's not a work of man. The question is whether or not you have the proof of faith. We covered this in the book of James. First episode we ever did a couple years ago. But since we're here in chapter 1, 
I want to point out another thing about the anger of man. And in chapter 1, verse 19 to 21, we're going to find out that God doesn't expect us to have an anger of man. We're going to find out that it cannot work the righteousness of God. And then he's going to tell us what the problem is. Something has, be, has to be removed from your life, and you must receive something that you haven't yet received. What is that in verse 19 to 21? So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And that's a command to receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Because somebody that struggles with the anger of man, well, they cannot work the righteousness of God. The problem is their heart. They haven't received the word implanted. He then commands them in verse 22 to, to become doers of the word and not hearers who deceive themselves. Because this person has deceived themselves. Now, back to Matthew. More. We need to look more at this heart. And what really is sin as Jesus defined sin? Well, in Matthew chapter 15, Jesus rebukes the people. Uh, the scribes and Pharisees came to Jesus because they didn't wash their hands when they ate bread. You find that in, chapter, in verses 1 and 2. So then Jesus kind of flips the table on them. Says that they really don't keep the word of God, but they follow their traditions. He calls them a hypocrite. He acknowledges that they seek to serve God. He acknowledges that they seek to honor God. But Jesus, in calling them hypocrites, what does he say the problem lies, Braden? In verse 8 and verse 9. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, and their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. You see, it gets back to teaching the commandments of men. Now, yes, people will mix Christ in, the Holy Spirit, the gospel. They'll talk about Jesus loves you and the grace of God and his mercy and coming in faith. But when it's not fully in truth, it's in God's eyes the doctrine of men. Yes, they will come before God. They will speak praises. But God says it's just lip service. You don't know me in your heart, even though they're going to God to worship him. But he says your worship is in vain. The problem comes down to what is the truth that they're believing in. It obviously wasn't fully the truth. And then he content, continues to tell them, what's a problem? And as you keep reading, he explains a parable that he spoke to the disciples about, it's not that which enters into the mouth that defiles a man, but that which proceeds out of the mouth which defiles the man. That was in verse 11. Now, the disciples didn't understand that. What do you mean, that which uh, comes out of the mouth, not that which enters? Because remember, they didn't eat with clean hands. So, Jesus explains to the disciples who were lacking understanding. And what did he say in verse 16 to verse 20? So Jesus said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. You see, it's the evil thoughts. It's the evil thoughts that defile a man. It's not the outward action. It's the fact that you have the thought. Just the thought, because he, he, from that heart, from that thought, will come the actions, will come the words out of your mouth, will come the other things. In the eyes of man, one man curses some, another. In the eyes of man, another man murders somebody. 
but it all came from the same hearts of anger and hate. In the eyes of God, they both committed murder. I want to look to Mark. And Mark, chapter 7. Same story, a little bit different uh, response, but I want to reinforce it here. Because it's all evil thoughts. Braden, go ahead and read Mark chapter 7, verse 18 to verse 23. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. And he said, What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. Evil thoughts in the heart of men. All evil thoughts. Adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. You see, it doesn't matter what it is. Deceit, lust, or desires of the world, slander, pride, foolishness, theft, murder, adultery. Any evil thought in the eyes of God. That is what defiles a man. And Luke... Chapter 6. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 6. Here on the Sermon on the Mount. On the Sermon on the Mount, in Luke chapter 6, Brayden, if you read verse 43... To verse 47. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. And then he goes and he talks about the the house built on the sand or built on the firm foundation. You see, if you cannot do the will of God, you continue to struggle with a bad fruit. A tree does not produce both kinds of fruit. Now, this passage here, if you were to take it and insert into Matthew chapter 7, you get the additional expansion of the teaching. You know, sometimes you don't have one book that records all the teachings at one time. But this was part of it. Jesus later goes on to this people who was seeking him, a people who was calling him Lord, a people who served in the church, even did miracles, evangelized, prophet, prophesied. And you know what he says to them? Depart from me. I don't know you. Why? Because it says they continued in their iniquity and sin. They still were the bad tree. They still had evil thoughts. They couldn't overcome. It is God that gives us a new heart and new mind. He purifies our thoughts. Go read about what God does through the blood of Jesus in Hebrews chapter 8, 9, and 10. We did episodes on each of those chapters. Has your conscience been cleansed from dead works to serve the living God? Has it been sprinkled clean? It's like what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3. Towards the end of the chapter, when he says, just as in the days of Noah, when he brought eight people safely through the waters, he says, corresponding to that, baptism is now saving you. Not the removal of dirt from the the flesh and outward washing, but it's an appeal to God for the good or the new conscience, that new heart. If you do not receive it, a work of God that only he can do, you're always going to continue to struggle with sin, And you're going to not be able to overcome. Go 
going back and looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And Matthew, when Jesus, again, speaking about the heart and the thoughts. And Matthew chapter 6. I'm sorry, 5. In verse 19 to verse 20, he talks about a righteousness that we must have. A righteousness that must pass, that of the scribes and the Pharisees. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees looked at the outward sin. They looked only at the Ten Commandments, primarily. But yet Jesus said something must be greater. It's because God doesn't look at the outward, he looks at the heart. The thoughts and intentions of the heart. What does he say in verse 19 and verse 20? Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now you may be thinking, what does he mean by exceeding the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees had an outward righteous. They weren't committing murder. They weren't stealing. They weren't going and committing adultery. But the problem is, as we just read earlier, God looks at the thought of the heart. So, Jesus explains. He explains what the Pharisees lived to. And, and the, all these things that I'm speaking, this is what I, I, I spoke to these two young men. So in verse 21 to verse 22, Jesus points out how the Pharisees understood murder, but then he says how God looks at it. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. That's right. Because God looks at the intentions of the heart. It's all the heart. Uh, what about adultery? In verse 27 to 28. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Hmm. Wow, God's pretty serious about this sin problem. Not just outward, but even of the thought. You see, the end, it's so significant, God doesn't want your whole body to be thrown into hell to the point it'd be better to go, go around lame. What's verse 28 and 29 say? Or 28 to 30? I'm sorry, 29 If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. That's right. That's right. One last thing I want to look at with sin, and I want to transition to what is love, because as I was meeting with these two young men, I went through and said, the key is, what are the differences between your faith, and I'll tell you the differences between my faith. Because without understanding the difference, how are you going to lead somebody to a faith that you think you have a saving faith, and they don't? Well, why? What are the differences? Now, the first thing, actually, and I should back up, the first thing these two young Mormons tried to explain to me is, well... But, uh, but I need you to read the Book of Mormon because it's different, because it says something different. You know, you know most Christians, they, they, they don't believe in the, the one true God. They believe in this Trinitarian, this, this you know, non-monotheistic God, but, but this three gods in one. And I said, well, I don't believe in that. Now, for those that are listening, you know, I just did an episode of the Trinity. I go through and speak what God says is true. And I expose the lies of the devil and the lies that's being propagated by many of the churches who are twisting and distorting the word of God. So I told these two young men, I said, I don't believe in that. I don't need to go to a different book. I said, this goes back to the point. There's many people who call themselves Christians and believe in the same Bible that I believe in. And yet they propagate this Trinity definition that you will not find in Scripture. I said, I don't, need, I don't need to go to another book. I can find it right here. I'll show you. And I went through and I covered some of those passages and how people are confused and deceived. 
So then I asked him, I said, so what other difference do you think it is between our belief and your belief? And they didn't really have that much to say. And that's when I said, well, let's start with sin. What is, how do you define sin? And I just explained, everybody here just heard, I went through some scripture, I'm not done. And then I went into love. What is love? There's a difference how the world defines love in many of these Christian churches versus how God defines love. I'm going to point out the differences. You must ask yourself, are you believing in the truth or do you have a lie mixed in to your knowledge of God? With respect to sin, back to James. I want to point out another passage from James. In James chapter 2, he goes in, he rebukes some of the people there. He was accusing them of having personal favoritism in their faith. He says, you can't do that. As you continue to read through chapter 2, in verse 2, through verse 3, it talks about showing special attention to a rich man versus a poor man. And simply where you offer them a seat. The problem is, by doing that and showing favoritism, what are they accused of in verse 4? Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Judges with evil thoughts. Huh. So then he accuses them of dishonoring the poor man. And not only that, in verse 7, what else does he accuse them of by this favoritism? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? They blaspheme the name of Christ by having those evil thoughts and then showing favoritism. But it all started with the evil thought. God judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart before you even do anything in it. The problem is we are supposed to be fulfilling something. What were we supposed to be fulfilling in verse 8? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Ah. So we're supposed to be fulfilling the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself, then you're doing well. Now, for those who may not understand, you see, to love your neighbor as yourself, the way God defines it, and we'll go to that here shortly, it's you no longer sin against your neighbor. You don't commit sin. You don't commit sin in your thoughts. Well, these people were committing sin, a partiality. The problem is it doesn't matter what sin you do. If you sin, and you have sin, and you can't overcome it, it's proof that sin still dwells within you. That wretched man in Romans chapter 7, we did an episode on that man. But yeah, the churches are lying to people and saying that's the normal Christian life, not understanding that God was contrasting the wretched man versus the blessed man. And people don't pick up on those contrasts. Because they're still the wretched man. And so, of course, that wretched man must be a Christian because they're a Christian. So they distort the word of God. So here, as he continues to say in verse 9, is partiality sin? But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. You see, if you commit sin, you're guilty under the law as a transgressor. There's only one way to escape the law, and that's through the grace of God to be freed from sin. That's how you escape it. Cover that whole episode and overcoming sin. The new heart. Being crucified with Christ. It's a work that God does. Has it been done in you? If you show partiality, you're committing sin and convicted by the law as a transgressor. Why is that? Why is it if you commit partiality? That wasn't in the Ten Commandments. But yet, what is, what is taught as you keep reading? For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. You're guilty of all. You're guilty of all. It doesn't matter. There is no one sin greater than another. You're guilty of all. He who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. If you don't commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you're still a transgressor of the law. So speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. Judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. See, people struggle. They can't show mercy to their fellow brethren when they upset them. They don't show mercy when they show favoritism to another person. They aren't showing mercy to somebody when they curse them under their breath. 
They aren't showing mercy when they covet another man's possessions. They aren't showing mercy when they put their pride above another man. No, no. But if you can't do that, and if you can't love, well, you're in trouble. It's proof that you don't have a perfected love. You have the love of the world, as Jesus talked about back on the Sermon on the Mount. He even said, what good is it? Sinners can agape love sinners. Later he goes on to say, you're to be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Let's look at love. So next thing I talked to these two young men, I said, well, what's your definition of love? And I got the typical standard answer. Do good to your neighbor. Help those who are in need. Well, sinners do that. Those being cast into hell do that. What's God's definition of love? Most people don't have it. We did a, an episode, a four-part series on Love the Greatest Commandment, went through Old and New Testament. God's consistent. You can listen to that. But to briefly highlight, I'm just going to go to Romans chapter 13, which is what I want with these two young men. And everyone who's listening, if there's stuff that I'm covering that you have not heard before, it should cause you alarm. Because this is how the devil works. Don't understand the full truth so he can keep you in darkness so you don't come to the full power of the Almighty God in this current life. Romans chapter 13. Read verse 8 through verse 10. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. That is why love fulfills the law. It doesn't sin against the neighbor anymore. You see, if you're still struggling with sin, if you have thoughts of sin, you're sinning against your neighbor. You're the defiled tree. You haven't been cleansed from all sin, which was the promise when you come in faith to Christ. Unless you didn't have that faith. Did you know God can, does not honor a faith that's not aligned with what he wants to do? You can't come to God in, in a faith that's of a lie and expect God to honor that. He won't. Why do you think it is that you have no power and you cannot overcome even though you desperately want to? Why is it when you continue to pray to God and ask Him to help you overcome the sin in your life, you continue to struggle? I know it's not because you, aren't, you don't want to. It's not because you aren't trying. Because trying can never do it. That's works of the law. God has already said no man will be justified by works of the law. The question is, have you come in faith and received the power so that God's power can do the work in you? To allow you to overcome. Next, what I shared with these men. As I said, the danger is we all read from the same book. Yet even though we read from the same book, everybody draws different conclusions. What is sin? What is love? Who is God? And yet the Bible warns us of the deception. In Galatians chapter 1, as I shared with these young men. Paul, speaking to the Galatian church. And these people, many of them had received the Spirit of God and were turning away after they had received the Spirit of God. We know that by as you go and you read chapter 3. But here in chapter 1, he's amazed that something's happening. What is he amazed of? In chapter 1, verse 6, through verse, let's go ahead and read through verse 10. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. For even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, 
If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. See, it's not about trying to please men. It's, it's simply, I'm going to do what God says and abide by his words. The problem is, they were being accused of deserting God for a different gospel. But then he says, but it's really not a different gospel. You see, they're still pre preaching and proclaiming Christ. It's just they're slightly distorting it. As you keep going on, Peter at one point stood condemned, and he had to rebuke him. Not because of what he was preaching, but just simply by his actions. You see, that's how serious God is about his truth. But God is good. His Spirit will guide and point out if there's a sin of ignorance to remove that. Or a willful sin, which can be worse. That can cause you to quench the Spirit. But people must understand the dangers. Everything I shared with the two men was a passage from 2 Corinthians, chapter 11. Again, the devil will take the Word of God. He'll preach the Word of God, just as he did try to do with Christ, but distort. In 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, Paul, appealing to the Corinthian church, church what does he say in chapter 11, verse 1 through 4? Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he, if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. See, they put up with it. They don't even realize it. They're going around and other people are preaching Christ, but it's a different Christ, not the true Christ. They're preaching the Holy Spirit, but it's not the true Holy Spirit. A gospel, but it's not the true gospel. The devil works as an angel of light, as an apostle of Christ, to deceive. And most people won't even know it. There's many people out there claiming to be true leaders of God. A true apostle, a true a prophet, a true evangelist or pastor. The problem is when you closely examine what they hold to in the word of God, you'll find inconsistencies. He warned them. Paul seeks to cut off opportunity of these people. What does he say in verse 12 to 15? But what I do... I will also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. I mean, you think about that. Apostles of Christ. Who would ever imagine that someone who looked like an apostle of Christ could possi possibly be in disguise as Satan doing the devil's work? They look like servants of righteousness. Peter talks about that too, that, that they're like in, in a Jew. They're hidden reefs. You don't even see them until you shipwreck your faith. They're hidden under the water. They feast and they celebrate you, with you. But they cannot stop from sinning. That's warned in 2 Peter chapter 2. Another passage I'm convicted I want to turn to is 2 Timothy. And these were all the things that God convicted me to share with these men. And God's faithful. He's convicted me in walking through the conversation. Because he knows that I'm just a man. I can't remember everything. Thank you, Father. In 2 Timothy. The truth and the firm foundation of God stands. What is this firm foundation of God in 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We are to depart from iniquity. We aren't to continue in sin. We're to depart from it. Now, it's not us trying. It's whether or not God does the work. This is the firm foundation of God. The question is, have you been sanctified? What does he say about sanctif- those who are sanctified? As you keep reading, verse 20 to 21. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. How do you become a vessel for honor? Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter... Oh, from the latter, all iniquity. You have to be cleansed from all iniquity. That's the other thing that Jesus promised to do that's not being taught. You have to be cleansed from all iniquity. That's the firm foundation of God. Then you'll be what? Then he will be a vessel for honor. Sanctified and useful for the Master, prepared for every good work. And it is God who cleanses us by the washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit. The blood of Jesus is the atoning for our sin and the payment, and the Holy Spirit is what washes and cleanses us and circumcises and gives us a new heart. So we're now to flee from all youthful desires. We're to pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord with what type of a heart, Braden? Pure heart. A pure heart! Only God can give the pure heart. But most people don't even know what they're asking for. They don't know what a pure heart is or what it's supposed to do. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient with wrong, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God might do what for them, Braden? Grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. Grant them repentance so that they might know the truth. Because until you're granted repentance and know the truth and come to the firm foundation of God, what are you still doing? Verse 26. That they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. You see, people, to do sin is to do the work of the devil. Do you not remember what's said in 1 John chapter 3? In 1 John chapter 3, it's pretty clear. God wants us to be children of God. It says in verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet appeared what we will be, but we know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him as He is. And everyone who is having this hope fixed on Him purifies Himself just as Jesus is pure. And that's the work that God does inside of us. But then there's another group of people. What's the other group of the everyone? What do they do? Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. See, then there's the sinner, the one who hasn't yet been cleansed, who cannot walk in light as God is light, as we're commanded, to be holy as our Heavenly Father is holy in all of our behavior. So he says, you know that he, Jesus, appeared in order to take away sin. In Jesus, there is no sin. Now, everybody agrees with that. But you know they don't understand the next part, uh, which talks about ourself. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Ah, uh, you see, we know that there's no sin in Jesus in verse 5. But did you not know in verse 6, no one who abides in Jesus sins? No one who sins has seen him or known him? If you continue to struggle with sin, I must ask you, how can you say you're abiding in Christ? How can you say that you are cleansed from all sin in 1 John 1, 9? If you are cleansed from all sin, if you receive the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit to now guide and lead you to remain in the holiness and the sanctification that God placed you, how is it that you fell back into sin or did you never escape it? Think about that, please. Please, think about it. No one who abides in Jesus sins. No one who sins has seen him or known him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who commits righteousness and practices righteousness is righteous as Jesus is righteous. But the one who commits sin is of the devil because the devil has sinned from the beginning. But the Son of God appeared for this purpose. To do what? Destroy the works of the devil. Destroy the works of the devil. No one who has been born of God, commits sin. Because God's seed abides in him. That's the Holy Spirit. 
He cannot sin because he has been born of God. Have you been born of God, you who are listening? Braden, I know you've been born of God. I mean, what do you have to say to someone who says, Braden, there's no way you can just be free of sin. I mean, that, that just seems impossible. I think I would have to say read 1 John. Well, what have you experienced in your life? Do you, do, you, do you see a difference between, I mean, you just received a new heart and a new spirit. It's, it's a complete difference. Did it happen over a couple days? couple it weeks happened, it happened instantly instantly and and this instantly happened like where where did the sin start where where would sin all the sin struggles always start in you before always in the mind always in yep. the mind these thoughts and, and then you would have to struggle outwardly to try to suppress them and seek to honor god and and confess your sins when you would sin but you didn't realize that the sin was already in the thought but when you finally came to the truth god removed all the thoughts isn't it an easy life? So easy. So now God allows you to have your devotion, your focus on, on doing his work and his will. No longer the will of the devil and the sin nature that used to live in you before it was crucified and put to death. This is what people don't understand, son, which I can call you my brother now. They don't understand. But you who are listening, this is my desire for you. This is why I went to Georgia. I've gone there twice now. Because there are people there who need to hear the truth. People there who have been baptized. People who are now living in power. Free from sin. They've been granted gifts of God to now serve in the kingdom. As God's Spirit leads them, and as one body, united. God is a God of power, people, not weakness. He's a God that wants to bless and overcome. Back to um, 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy, chapter 3, he talks about that there's going to be people who unfortunately God is going to say they're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. In chapter 3, verse 5, what does it say they, they have? They have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. And from such people, turn away. Turn away from those people. You see, they don't have power to walk by that firm foundation of God. They don't have power to escape the snare of the devil and the sin. They hold to a form of godliness. They don't have any power. And that's one of the things I, I told these two young men. I said, here's the differences. One, people don't understand what sin is. They don't understand love. But the secret ingredient is the power. When you don't have the power, you cannot accept that definition of sin, and you cannot accept that definition of love. But yet, those are God's definition. The problem isn't with God. The problem is with mankind who refuses to accept the truth of God. That's why you must make certain that you know the truth. And you must make certain you understand the differences, and you can reconcile them in Scripture. Now, if you have questions, please email us. I can answer the questions through email. We can reach out and talk. We have many different people. If you're a woman, we can connect you with uh, several women that we have um, that you can speak with to understand. Uh, there's women that, uh, that do not have believing spouses. There's those that do. So, you know, we can, we can help whatever struggle that you're going through, as well as women who recently came to the truth and others who have been in the truth for uh, a while. So whatever you need, Right, we can connect you, as well as other men. There's other men. You don't have to speak with me. You can speak with other people. If you're a young man and you want to speak with Braden, Braden's 21 years old, uh, we can put you in touch with Braden. Next. Deception. Again, in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, he says that people are going to come and deceive. Not only are they going to deceive, they're deceiving themselves. What does verse 13 say? But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You see that? Not only are they deceiving others, they're deceived themselves. It's no wonder. You know, Second Peter chapter 3, Peter warns us. He says that people are going to distort the scriptures. Some things are hard to understand, but the Spirit of God gives understanding. What does he say in Second Peter 
chapter 3, verse 14, to verse 17. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, Beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. The error of the wicked. You see, we are to be found by God in peace, spotless, and blameless, as we live a holy life uh, before Him. Not by our power, but by the power of God in us. And there are many who will speak of these things, but the untaught and the unstable are distorting the truth as they do all the rest of Scripture to their own destruction. Don't follow those people. Knowing this beforehand, you must be on your guard so you're not carried away by the error of these unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. That's why I plead with you and I pleaded with these young men that I was speaking to. I said, I am not here. I don't want you to follow me. I want you to turn to God. I want you to drown yourself in the word of God. I want you to appeal to the heavenly father. I want you to cling to him. I want you to seek him and his power and his holiness so that you can find him. And when you find him, you're going to be free. No longer warring against the sin that dwells within you in your mind and your thoughts, but now free to serve God in holiness and righteousness to be clothed with all power, to receive the gifts of the Spirit, to serve and minister in the church for His glory. So with that, it comes down to the end. As I pointed out to these young men, I said the biggest significance, because they agree that sin is wrong, they agree that we should love, their big beef about the Trinity well, that was put to death. I said, I don't believe in that. I believe what God says about himself and his son. That's what I believe, the word of God, not the traditions and teaching of men. I said, but the biggest issue that it comes down to with these two young men, I told them is, you guys don't have power. You're unable to live like the early church. You're unable to live and imitate Christ. I shared with them in John. I believe it's John chapter 14. Let me turn there. It's just like Philip before they received the Holy Spirit. He didn't understand. Philip said in verse 8 of chapter 14, Lord, show us the Father and it's good for us. They didn't understand. You see, Jesus was one with the Father. The Father was one with, him, one with Him. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Just like it says, we're to be one with the Father and one with Christ. That Jesus taught us. You keep reading in John chapter 14 and John chapter 17. So what does He say to Philip in verse 9 to verse 10? Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. That's right. You see, Jesus spoke the Father's words. Jesus did the Father's works. And that's what he says. In verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. But if, son, Braden, brother, if we are to be doing the same, if we're to have the same fullness and deity that Christ had, that it tells us in Ephesians, Colossians, and 2 Peter, well, then does that surprise you what Jesus then says in the very next verse? If, if he says that we also are to be one with the Father, does it then surprise you in verse 12 of what he says? Most assuredly, I say to you, 
He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And see, people don't understand that, because they don't have power. When you look in Mark, at the end, in chapter 16, Jesus says, Mark 16, verse 15 to verse 18. What does he say? Verse 15, he says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And then what does he say? He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. And there's other places that talk about the different signs. You can read about them in, in, in uh, Acts and what, uh, what's accomplished. Those things still happen today. I can testify that those things still happen today. They are alive and well in the church. God's church, not the false church. And I also say there's warnings. So a lot of people that go around say in, in certain charismatic movements that if you don't speak in tongues, therefore you don't have the Holy Spirit. They look to the one event of Pentecost. The problem is what they don't understand is God does a work. He looks at the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Some people receive the Holy Spirit of God through tongues of fire coming upon them. Other people receive the Holy Spirit when they're water baptized at that moment. Some people receive it before water baptism. Some receive it after. Some people receive it through the laying on of hands. Some people receive it through a coal touching their lips in the presence of God with what happened to Isaiah. God works in His way. He looks at the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So many people try to come up with a secret formula. They try to put God in a box. With respect to tongues, God's really clear in 2 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 11 and also 13. When he talks about the different gifts. In tongues, he specifically says, not everyone will speak in tongues. It is God who gives the gifts as he chooses for the edification of the church. The other thing that you'll find in most people, and they like, I feel like they, through, through the deception of the demons, a lot of people, they manifest tongues through their own effort. Others through the spirit of demons. It's not through the spirit of God. How do I know? Well, the spirit of God isn't going to lead people into disobedience to go against God's instructions. When you look in his word about the use of tongues and how it's being abused. And I believe it's in um, chapter 14. And he talks about the order if someone is going to speak in a tongue. Let me just find it. In verse 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at most three people. In each person in turn, and one must interpret. If there's no interpreter, he must remain silent in the church and let him speak to himself and of God. Well, there you go. What you'll see in some churches is the whole galley of them in chaos, just all chanting in tongues. That's uh, not what God says. You'll see them chanting, no interpreter, not speaking one at a time, but yet in, in, in the service, only three, at most three, are allowed to speak in a service. But they're disobedient because it's the spirit of man or the spirit of the devil, not of God. So we must be careful with all things. But yes, tongues is a gift. It is real when God gives it. Same with all the other gifts that are discussed in the word of God. 
They are absolutely real and active today. The other thing, when you look at Jesus and what I left with these men, I said, why was Jesus able to overcome sin? Everybody agrees that he was born sinless. I said, but yet aren't we to be born again? Does it not say if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Does it not say that the washing of the Holy Spirit cleanses us from all unrighteousness, all sin, so that we can be pure light and walk in light as our Heavenly Father's light, to be holy as God is holy? You see, Jesus had a desire of God. He came sinless. We can have a desire of God. We can be cleansed of all sin. And we can receive the same power, even though we have the weakness of this body, the same body that Christ had, but yet we can overcome like he overcame. It's the whole argument that's made in Romans chapter 8. So go to Romans chapter 8. I'll stop in Ephesians, and then I'll pray and we'll be done. In Romans chapter 8, Braden, who, who is there no condemnation for? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Well, how did Christ live? For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Ah, this law of the Spirit of life, the same Spirit of life that was in Christ, that same Spirit is what is to set us free from the law of sin and of death. Not just the payment of the penalty, that was the blood of Christ, but the Spirit of God gives us the power and the freedom to overcome. Did Jesus have the weakness of the flesh? What does verse 3 say? For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. That's right, because Christ came with the fullness of the deity of God in him. So even though he had the weakness of the flesh in the body of man, because he was had no sin, and because he had the power of the Spirit of God in him, he was able to overcome. And yet so now we are to walk, and we are to fulfill the requirement of the law, by living and walking in the Spirit just as He did. What does it say in verse 4? That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's right. That's if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. You see, it says in verse 9, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to Him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, that was put to death, the Spirit is now alive because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then He who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Do you have the Spirit of God Almighty dwelling in you? Do you have the Spirit of life? Are you able to now meet the requirements of the law through living and walking in righteousness? Verse 12, Beloved, we are not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. If you are living according to the flesh, you will die. But if you're living by the Spirit, the, you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you, are, you will live. Who are the sons of God, Braden, in verse 14? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Those are the sons of God. Ephesians. So my prayer, my prayer for everyone listening is that you come to the knowledge of the truth. That you be added to the body of Christ in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12. And to be added to the body of Christ, you must attain to three things. One, the unity of the faith. There's only one faith. It's what God says, not what man says. The knowledge of the Son of God, the true knowledge of the Son of God, not a fake knowledge. And to the perfect man. And in verse 13, it tells us what that perfect man is. The measure of stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Have you attained to that?
Well, maybe if you haven't, that's, that's, that's why in verse 14, you're still an infant. You're still an infant in Christ, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. It's because you're being deceived by the word of God and what's true and what's not. But I pray as Paul prayed in chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family on heaven and earth derives its name, that Almighty God would grant you according to the riches of His glory, that you might be strengthened with power through the Father's Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith, that you would be rooted and grounded in love, that you might be able to comprehend with all the saints the breadth, length, height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you might be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to God, who is able to do far more abundantly, beyond all that we can ask or imagine, according to God's power that works inside of us, to Him, the Father, be the glory, both in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Father, that is my prayer for the people. That they find power. That they come to the truth. Just as your Son, Jesus, said, the one who still commits sin is a slave of sin. They will not get to remain in the house. I pray that people come to power and freedom. Father, convict those who are listening. Let them dig deep into your word. Let them get on their knees and appeal to you, O Father, to show them and teach them and help them understand and have peace in their mind and in their heart with your word and find truth. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.